Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, who here is a Foundry developer? I'll raise your hand. Very well. So pretty much everybody, 80% of the audience. And who here has seen um, our Sableur v2 uh, core repository, which has influenced this talk? Very well. One, one, two, three, four. Okay, so like 10 people. Not too bad. Um, we're going to talk about like testing and best practices in Foundry, um, which is this uh, development toolkit for Ethereum applications. Um, my background is um, yeah, I, I've been an Ethereum developer for five years. Um, now I'm the co-founder and solid to lead at Sabre Labs. Um, we're building a money streaming protocol um, on Ethereum, and um, we've uh, we've worked with Foundry for like 15 months um, to ship our uh, V2 protocol. Um, which is pretty cool. Have a look. Uh, we have stream NFTs, nonlinear streaming, and many cool features. Um, and yeah, we just announced that last week. And um, part, of the, part of the protocol was um, our development and research process was invested in like trying to figure out what is, are there any objectively good and like, you know, good ways to write your founder tests. And I worked very cl closely with the Foundry team to come up with like a set of uh, uh, you know, uh, guides and, and uh, rules of thumb for how you go about like you have your protocol and then how do you use Foundry to like scale it and like t test that scale basically. Um, now let's talk a bit about Foundry. You know they made their uh, debut in 2022, um, and before. Before Foundry, Solidity was rarely used for testing smart contracts. If you, I mean, Truffle and Hard Hat, I think everybody uh, know, like has heard about these frameworks. They were using JavaScript and TypeScript, but the same thing basically, um, to like test. So we have Solidity, which is like this financial, um, uh, you know, programming language, like handles money. Uh, we, were, we were using this, you know, 25 year old, old, old language used for uh, writing web apps to test like finance apps, right? So. Um, the, the, the problem is that many Foundry tests, because of like Foundry Super New, are like not organized. Um, and the way it goes is that you typically start with your um, simple example test like this. Um, uh, you know, it's nice, you have like a simple unit test, and um, you know, for, for like simple cases, this is enough. Um, however, you know, contracts have a lot of, you know, paths and like functions and, and uh, state. So what happens um, is that you end up with like monolith test contracts where you have uh, test function name one, two, three, four, and uh, there's like no structure at all. Um, because again, it's like Solidity has just been, you know, uh, Solidity is still very new as a, like a testing framework language. Um, right, so how do we solve this? Uh, or like what are the problems that has, you know, like that, that lead people there is, I mean, firstly, is, Undirected development, so there, are, there are um, uh, there are no English specifications for your smart contract protocol. Um, they, you have no file structure. You, you, I've seen these files with like thousands of of, of um, uh, you know, like tests, and they, they test different contracts and they test the same function, but like the tests are like not ordered, and uh, there's gen like generally a lack of categories um, between, for example. Um, you know, like simple unit tests and like fork tests which run against Ethereum mainnet. Um, so how do we break free? Um, well, the first and foremost thing, go to the Foundry book. There is um, a tutorial called Best Practices written by uh, Matt Solomon and uh, Odysseus and various Foundry community members, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, they have like this two-page collection of like tips and tricks. Um, uh, that should be like I think the first top, top three things you read about Foundry when you get going. Um, but then also there are a couple of recommendations I will give in this talk and I have classified them under two um, uh, uh, categories. It's like high level structures and low level design and spec. Um, at a very high level, the idea is like to split your Foundry tests in, into clear cut categories. Um, because this helps with like filtering tests with your CI, um, also like to hone in on you know various aspects of your protocol. Like for example, if you want to focus on your like reverts, um, then use contract inheritance. Like have like a base test contract which um, you uh, put your shared logic in there, and then you inherit from that in all of your other tests. And uh, the good old principle of like using the you, you treat the contract name as a describe block. 
Uh, if you are familiar with Mocha and like in JavaScript, they have like these describe um, uh, like function with block contexts. And the idea is like you create a test file called you know foo, which is your contract under test, and you use that as like a pseudo describe block. Um, okay, so what what are the infamous categories I've been talking about? Um, we uh, have structured them under four um, uh, categories, and they are unit, integration, invariant, and fork. Um, they each serve a different purpose, and they like de they each attack your protocol in various ways. Um, but the idea is, units are um, tests involving a single contract. Uh, integration are like tests involving multiple contracts, and this means including if you your function includes an ERC20 contract, that's an integration because. An ERC20, like there are many ERC20s, and you want to like, I, like draw a distinction between your you know, simple pure functions calculating math, uh, you know, like logic, and your complicated integrations, and that, that includes ERC20. Then you have your invariance, which is um, um, uh, like expression that should always hold true. For example, in ERC20, the total supply should equal the sum of all the token balances. And finally, you have four tests where you want to like make sure that your tests actually run um, against the real Ethereum mainnet contracts, and you use like Alchemy or something to like fork mainnet. Um, then, each of, each category from before, um, you can split it under two other categories, um, which is concrete and fuzz. Concrete are your standard deterministic tests that, that like have no inputs; um, they're just like hard coded values uh, to 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 check that you know the output is the same as the input. But then Founder gives you like fuzz, like 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 fuzzing, which is super powerful. Um, but because the fuzzing logic is typically different, like your test will look very differently when you have fuzzing arguments. You want to draw a distinction between them. Um, again, it helps with CI filtering and generally just like explaining your protocol to somebody who just like picking up your um, uh, testing suit. Now, uh, let's get to the, the uh, heart of this uh, presentation, which is the um, uh, low level design is back. This is our innovation, um, is the branching tree technique. I will go, but I'll, I'll present in the next few slides. Um, this is a very minimal um, specification language that we basically invented. Um, which is super cheap, like, you, I mean, it, it, there's, there's no API or something, you're just like using uh, ASCII characters, um, I'll show you in a bit. But just very, very, very briefly to mention this um, naming convention here, uh, again, uh, hat tip to the Foundry uh, best practices team, um, uh, you know, like use these because um, if, it's useful for like filtering tests, for example, if you want to like generate a gas report, you don't want to look at reverts. You don't care about like when somebody you know uh, uh, m makes an error and they get like a uh, like a revert. You want to get like a, 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 a an average gas gas cost for the successful execution paths, um, right? So the branching tree technique. Um, the idea is to like bef before you write your solidity test, um, write an English specification, um, which. Uh, uh, defines the contract state, the function parameters, and um, builds up this hierarchy of, um, of uh, uh, basically the, all the possible execution paths in your, in your function, um, you map them out with English like this. And um, this is super useful, not just for yourself to like, you know, map out the function logic, but also like you can share this with your non solid team members, and they can get like a feel of like what's going on in the function. It's like super cheap. I mean, you just install like a VS Code extension to get highlighting. Um, and it helps you with like structuring your, your I mean, just for yourself, like, like think deeply about all the possible states your function can be in. And this is an example. Uh, this is how we look in Solidity. The trick is to use empty modifiers, um, which just give you the um, hierarchy of like how, what is the contract state that should occur for this task to pass. Because in the real world, there's never just like three lines where the contract state you know, is just there in the background. No, the contract state massively influences whether your task should you know, pass or not. So this gives you like, a, 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 like an English, um, like a natural language um, specification for what should happen for this assertion to pass. Um, very well, so what are the benefits? As I said, it's plain English, easy to learn and teach. Um, it also doubles as a test structuring approach um, because you like, have the tree files in your actual version control. 
um, and it can be shared with non-technical team. And the best thing is that this is potentially automatable. Um, so imagine um, you know, building a tool which starts from this tree and then it generates like a skeleton solidity file with the empty modifiers and the, all the test function names. And I mean that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning building something like, like using GPT to like, you know, convert the English specification into uh, uh, test function names and modifiers. And that's like, like next level testing in Solidity because you like, you know, a third of your job would be done by this tool. Um, if you just have three, then everything falls into place. Um, right, and just a, a, a quick comparison here. Um, like the reason why BTT is, is cool is that it's both entry level and it's moderately uh, effective. Um, you know, BTT was, uh, I was inspired by Cucumber Gherkin. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, it's a super du duper cool language. It's just that it doesn't have support for Solidity. And it's way more formal than what I showed you. And the barrier to entry is higher because you have like dozens of keywords and they also have like, they enforce like a matching between the tree and the Solidity code. I'm, I'm not enforcing anything, I'm just like, the BTT approach is like to start with a tree, not, not the Solidity test. Like first define, spec out your, uh, your function before writing the test, that's the core idea. And anyway, and finally, Sertora TLA, you know, uh, uh, impressive languages and products, but the, the barrier entry entry is super high, senior level, costs money, uh, it's highly effective, but uh, there we go. So like, and by the way, these are not mutually exclusive, so I, I, I could envision a repo using BTT for like, you know, early design and spec, and then as time goes on and you raise money or whatever, you go to Sertora. Um, anyway, um, that was it. Thanks for coming. Uh, you can find us uh, at sabler.com, uh, sabler on Twitter, and I'm personally at these two handles on, on Twitter and GitHub. And the QR code here is um, pointing to our GitHub repository where you can see uh, uh, hundreds of tree files and how we implemented them in Solidity with, again, hundreds of modifiers. So if you want to have a look, yeah, that's our repo. Thanks for, for coming. Yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so you showed the modifiers that you apply to the functions, and you said, did you say those are empty modifiers? Do they do anything? Are they actually doing setup or uh, empty? Good question. Let me go back to the example. Um, uh, so um, you don't have to have the modifiers be empty. Um, it's just that you, you want to have them so that you mirror every single node in the tree. So if you go here, um, all of these branches, uh, the idea is you want them to occur um, for the test to pass. But in some cases, the, maybe the state is defined in some set of function outside of your test contract. So in that case, you still want the modifier to give you the English specification for like what's, ha what's going on in that particular test. Um, but you don't want to add like, you know, uh, define any state in there. Um, however, there are cases when you do want to do that, and this example here shows you that in the when not null modifier, I'm creating a, the default stream, and that will be used, the default stream ID will be used in the actual test when I call the um, uh, status of function. Um, yeah, I've actually done something similar like the modifiers, uh, but I've used uh, contract inheritance instead and then basically called the contracts when something. I don't know if you've experimented with this approach as well and if you have like a comparison to using modifiers. Um, the, the short answer is that it's not mutually exclusive. So um, we're actually using a lot of contract inheritance in our own code base as well. It's just that for um, for complicated trees, this is a simple example. Uh, in our code base, we have trees with like 10 uh, levels of depthness. Uh, uh, and, and for those, like imagine having, you know, like 10 contracts that inherit one another. Um, it, it gets really clunky when you have complicated trees. So modifiers are like much more slim. Um, but, you know, as I said, like they're not mutually exclusive. Like you can have, um, for example, um, you can have a, a, a big, shared contract that sets up, you know, 10 streams, you know, in like Sabler's case, 
and reuse them in multiple uh, test contracts which have other modifiers. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a question of like how slim your code is. Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask, um, so the modifier that you show, is it like a similar to set up and tear down when we write tests in, uh, in JavaScript and hard hat? Uh, sorry, the, uh, the question was if this is similar to this describe block in JavaScript? You know, no, the, you know, in, <coughs> in, um, in JavaScript, when often you do tests where you write setups and, te and teardowns like fixtures. You, you know, you set up something, <clears throat> you like setting up can be deploying of a contract, setting all the access control, and then you run all the tests. And then you have a teardown at the end of the describe okay. block, you clear everything, like you clear all the contract state. Um, do you have something similar like that to recommend in Foundry or? Oh, sure. I mean, that's uh, um, handled by Foundry itself. Uh, it's, it's called a setup function and Foundry, um, after every test, it like flushes out the uh, entire blockchain state and you don't have to think about it at all. There's like a vm.snapshot cheat code where you can do like more advanced setups where like you manually clear the blockchain state during testing, but you typically don't need that. Like we're, we're, I don't think we're using that in our own code base and we have like hundreds of files, so um, yeah. Okay, cool. And yeah, what's the tool that you use for scrolling in the slide? Because this is also awesome, men. <laughs> oh, so you mean this? Yes. <laughs> the like the presentation software yeah, like how do you? Oh, uh, it's called uh, Reveal.js. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, I will upload my presentation on my Twitter profile, and you can like download it from there. Yeah. Any question anymore? Just, just one. Uh, what are you most excited about in in Foundry or in variant testing? Kind of moving forward, is there anything that you think like an evolution that's coming down the lane that you're particularly excited about? <sighs> Well, I mean, Foundry invariants are, um, I think, the, the, the coolest type of tests here, if you, if you go up here. Invariants are, bar none, the most powerful um, uh, like testing framework here. Um, what am I excited about? I, there, there isn't anything in particular. Like, like, invariants are pretty nice as they are today. There's only some hiccups here and there, like some missing features that I reported on GitHub. Uh, on Foundry, but uh, I would say that I mean, just Foundry as it is today is is major evolution for for Ethereum development. So sorry for the boring answer, but like Foundry is is the exciting thing now. And invariance, if you don't have invariance tests, like that should be your number one priority tomorrow, or like when you go back to your development uh, 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 back at home. Like invariance are a way to um, so if you don't know them, it's like expressions that should always hold true no matter what, and it's like fuzz different, you like call your protocol in like hundreds of calls, sequences and whatever, it's like super powerful. Okay, one last question. Uh, thank you. Um, so there's a new EIP for transient storage, so I was curious maybe do you guys have any ideas what to do with that or how it could benefit testing or something else with uh, the development tool? Um, that, that EIP will be useful for um, Table tests. There's a GitHub issue about this. Um, Foundry doesn't have su uh, yet have support for um, uh, declarative um, uh, array. So you specify an array of inputs, and each input in the array gets tested. Um, Foundry doesn't support that natively, and you have like to use these these complicated storage structures with like storage arrays to um, uh, have like a modifier that loops through all those, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, define array. So, you know, transient storage will basically speed up that that testing paradigm, but um, I wouldn't say it directly affects what I presented on this um, uh, uh, keynote here um, because, you know, the, the tree is just, uh, uh, let's see, this is just like a non solidity file. It's like you just keep an inversion control. It's, uh, it's more like a, uh, uh, an emergent human phenomenon of what I'm talking about here. Not, n not so much uh, EIP uh, implementations. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And just one quick mention at the end. Uh, we have saved your swag, uh, like 20 t-shirts. If you guys want to grab one, here they are. Thank you for, for having me again. Thank you.